So the topic that I was given uh, to start us off this morning was um, Hyler Control and Renorophy. A reminder about the Naris meeting in Las Vegas. Um, so Hyler Control, of course, is your clamping. And there's several different ways to do this. I don't want to overlap with Caton's talk later because he's going to talk about limiting your warm ischemia time, so I don't want to impinge too much on his talk. Uh, but obviously the concept is that you can clamp the artery and vein. You can not clamp the vein. Uh, you can do early unclamping, uh, which we'll talk about, selective clamping, and then completely off clamp. So these are all different options going from more to less. I would see the most is clamping artery and vein all the way to clamping nothing. Thing. So one of the times that you need to limit warm ischemia, and again, Caitlin's going to talk about this more, so stay tuned. Uh, but I would tell you just as a general concept to begin with that most patients don't need this. Most patients just clamp the main renal artery, don't worry about it. If they have two normal kidneys, normal renal function, uh, all of these other techniques are a luxury item. But there are some times when you can benefit from having either a completely off clamp or a selective artery clamping, early on clamping, all of these techniques, uh, particularly for example for a solitary kidney, a patient who already has a creatinine of two and a half, three for example, uh, patients who have multiple tumors. So imagine you have three tumors in the same kidney. Well, if you clamp the main renal artery and cut out three tumors and sew three tumors, you're going to have a really long ischemia time. So that's when you want to start thinking about, well, maybe I do the easy ones off clamp and then clamp for the big one, or maybe I do selective artery clamping and I clamp different segmental arteries. Uh, and then electively, when it's like a super chip shot, you know, just makes perfect sense to do um, selective artery clamping or off clamp. If you have like a really tiny tumor that's very peripheral, you can do it off clamp. But nowadays we're doing surveillance on those, so those are probably not ones you'd be doing a partial on anyway. So the concept of selective artery clamping, of course, is that you're clamping segmental arteries, so branches of the renal artery rather than the main renal artery. Uh, and this is, of course, creating regional ischemia because the arteries are end arteries rather than the entire kidney being ischemic. Uh, and this is probably better than main artery clamping um, for, again, those situations where the patient needs it for solitary kidney, et cetera. Um, but um, sometimes this is better than off clamp completely. Why? Now, yes, you are going to have a region of the kidney that is ischemic, but the problem with doing it off clamp or basically with no clamp whatsoever is that it's going to be a bloodier case, of course. So uh, I think it's a nice compromise between main artery clamping where the entire kidney is ischemic and not clamping at all where it's a very bloody case, visibility is going to be poor, obviously you don't want a positive margin, you want to see what you're doing. So segmental artery clamping or selective artery clamping is kind of a nice compromise. So it's good to know how to do it. But there are certain times when you want to avoid this and not do it at all. Don't do selective artery clamping or off clamp uh, when you're very early in your experience. It wouldn't be something you would want to do within your first few robotic partial nephrectomies. And also don't do it when you need a bloodless field. And I'll give you some examples of when you would want to do that. You do need to be prepared for watershed areas, basically areas around the tumor where you may have contribution from more than one segmental artery. So let's say, for example, you have a tumor that's on the edge of the posterior kidney and the anterior kidney. Well, the posterior segmental artery is going to be feeding the posterior third of the kidney. So you may find that if you clamp an anterior segmental artery that when you cut the front side of the tumor, it doesn't bleed, but then when you get to the back side, it starts bleeding, arterial bleeding, uh, because you've got overlapping segmental arteries that are feeding that tumor. And I'll show you some examples of when to expect that. And then when you do selective artery clamping, it's going to be similar to a patient, for example, who has more than one renal artery. So let's say you have a patient with two renal arteries, three renal arteries, and you're only clamping one. That's going to be the same thing with segmental artery clamping, is that you're going to have more venous bleeding in those situations. Why? Because the arteries are end arteries, but the veins are not. The veins all connect in the kidney. So if you only clamp one of three arteries, for example, or you only come clamp one segmental artery of all the different segmental arteries that are still feeding that kidney, that kidney is still getting arterial inflow. The veins all connect in the kidney, so you're going to get more venous back bleeding from that kidney. So just be prepared for it. It's not prohibitive. You just need to be prepared for it. Uh, and of course, you don't have the option in those cases to clamp the vein because you've got arteries still feeding the kidney. That makes it worse. So you just have to live with that venous bleeding in these cases. So when are the times that you wouldn't do off clamp or segmental artery clamping? Obviously, the larger and deeper the tumor. This tumor is not going to have one segmental artery that's feeding it. So this is not the one that you would do segmental artery clamping. I avoid it for hyalur tumors. Um, I like to have, with a hyalur tumor, I like to have a pretty bloodless field. 
because I want to be able to see the branches of the artery. I want to make sure that I don't cut into them or sew into them. Uh, so I like to have main renal artery clamping whenever possible for hyalur tumors. Completely endophytic tumors, same thing. If you have a completely endophytic tumor, you're relying on your ultrasound. You can't see that tumor from the surface. So you're relying on your ultrasound to know where to cut. And when you start cutting into the kidney, if you have arterial bleeding coming from that kidney because you messed up, you didn't clamp the right thing or whatever, uh, or even just a lot of venous back bleeding, you could get lost very easily. So I would suggest against doing selective clamping or off-clamp for completely endophytic tumors. And then for these infiltrative tumors, these tumors that don't have a nice round appearance with a pseudocapsule, these are usually higher grade tumors that infiltrate into the kidney. And usually you need a wider margin. You need to kind of see where you are because the tumor is going to go out further than what you think. So again, in these cases, don't do selective artery or off-clamp. That's my opinion. Uh, so technical points. Let's talk about real artery clamping, the how-to. So these are a few just kind of you know tips that I would share with you. So my personal preference is that I will dissect out and place a vessel loop around the main renal artery. Uh, now, even if I'm planning to do a segmental artery clamping, I'll still be prepared to clamp the main renal artery if I have to. So that way, if I start cutting into the tumor and it turns out, oops, you know, I messed something up, I can go back and clamp the main renal artery if necessary. Or if I'm doing it completely off clamp and then it's just bleeding more than I like, I go clamp the renal artery. Why the vessel loop? The vessel loop is a full length vessel loop. Full length vessel loop, we put a hemolock on it. So if I have to, I can find it in a pool of blood. Because when you're clamping urgently because the kidney's bleeding more than you like, the blood's all gonna pool down, it's gonna cover the hilum. You're not gonna be able to find the artery. That big long vessel loop is your way to get to it. You just grab the vessel loop, pull on it, that'll slow down the bleeding. Your assistant can suck down following the vessel loop until you find the artery you put the clamp on. So that's my routine. I like to put the vessel loop on there. Um, and then I use ultrasound, sometimes the firefly to identify the perfusion. I'll show you some pictures of that. And then when you are doing renal artery clamping, you have the option, of course, of using bulldogs. You can do a Rommel tourniquet, but I think most people use bulldogs. There's the robotic bulldog, the laparoscopic bulldog. And then one thing that you want to have in your arsenal is micro bulldogs. And the reason why is because if you're not clamping the main renal artery, if you're gonna clamp any second, third generation branch arteries, these are little arteries. If you put that big, huge bulldog that you usually use on there, you're gonna crimp the heck out of it and you'll see it afterwards. And so you should be worried about potentially injuring that branch of the renal artery. So if I'm clamping anything other than the main renal artery, if it's a smaller branch or for example, if the patient has more than one renal artery and they're all small renal arteries, I don't wanna put a big bulldog on there. So I'll use micro bulldogs. And there's different versions of these. There are plastic disposable ones like the neurosurgeons use for clipping aneurysms and stuff. Um, there's also the ones that I use are the ones that are plastic surgeons surgeons use when they do free flaps. And they come from little tiny, they're little black metal bulldogs that are go from this small size, they're literally like a centimeter long, they're tiny. And then the one that I use more often is maybe about three centimeters long. And they have a smooth tip rather than the teeth on them. Um, and then as I mentioned again, um, you can clamp the vein or not clamp the vein. You can only clamp the vein if you're clamping all of the arterial inflow to the kidney. Um, but you don't have to clamp the vein. And I think a lot of us used to clamp the vein in the past. Uh, I certainly did when I started doing them, but then I stopped and I haven't done it for hundreds of cases. So, so I've not clamped the vein really um, at all for a long, long time. So this is the concept that I was talking about with using the Doppler ultrasound to identify the arterial inflow to the kidney. One of the things that's going to make you nervous about doing challenging tumors, you kind of increasing your experience and going on to more and more complex tumors when you do partials, one of the things that's gonna make you nervous is arterial bleeding. The bigger, the deeper the tumor, you're gonna say, oh, what, if I, what do I do if it starts bleeding? And then, oh my gosh, this huge tumor, whatever, there's big, deep, you know, big arteries that are deep in that defect. That may make you nervous about taking on the more challenging partials. But one of the things that will make you comfortable with it is to be able to identify the arterial flow before you start cutting into the kidney. Meaning that you want to know for sure that before you start cutting into the kidney that you've got that part of the kidney shut down. How do you do that? This is what I do on every single partial nephrectomy. 100% of the time. I don't care how tiny the tumor is. I don't care how exophytic, doesn't matter. Every single time I do this experiment, I use the ultrasound probe with the Doppler function. I have my vessel loop on the artery that I'm planning to clamp. Could be the main renal artery, could be one of three arteries, could be a segmental artery. Whatever it is that I'm planning to clamp, I have the vessel loop on it. With my left hand, I just pull up on that vessel loop and the Doppler signal should go away. If it doesn't, that's the wrong artery or you missed an artery. 
it should go away. And then when you let go, it comes back. So this is a routine that I do on every single case. This is how I know before I start cutting into the kidney that I've identified the correct renal artery to clamp. And where the yellow arrow is pointing is basically the junction between the tumor and the kidney. Why? I'm not just looking at the tumor, in other words, with the ultrasound. I'm looking at the junction of normal kidney and tumor because that's where I'm going to be cutting. So you can repeat this experiment in multiple places around the tumor so that you can make sure if you're doing segmental artery, for example, that you didn't miss some other inflow. You can move the ultrasound probe around, look for any, any Doppler signal, and then when you let go of the vessel loop, it comes back. This is a video of the exact same case. So watch the, when I pull on the vessel loop, the Doppler signal goes away. When I let go, it comes back. That's telling me that if I clamp the artery that has the vessel loop on it, it's not gonna bleed when I cut into the kidney in this location. So again, I do this on every single case. The other option you have, which I don't do routinely, I'll do it sometimes with segmental clamping, uh, is to use the firefly. And the idea here is that you would clamp the vessel that you're planning to clamp, give ICG, have, have anesthesia give ICG, and then use the firefly to make sure that that part of the kidney doesn't light up. Early in your experience, you can do this with the main renal artery. So if you wanna make sure, for example, that yes, indeed, this is the main renal artery, there's no accessory arteries, I'm not too far out on it and it hasn't branched already, you wanna be sure that you're clamping the main renal artery and shutting down that entire kidney, you can do this with the main renal artery. Put a clamp on the artery, give the ICG. If the kidney doesn't light up, you know you're in good shape. And this is just a pictorial example of that, just to show that sometimes you get surprised. Sometimes you're planning to clamp a segmental artery and you find that there's actually a watershed area. So for example, you see the tumor here and you see there's some green on this far side of the kidney. So that's telling you that you either need to clamp another segmental artery if you don't want that area to bleed, or more often what I'll do is I'll just start cutting on the non-bleeding side, do that side last, and then so, you know, whip stitch it pretty quickly. So here's an example of a case where I would do full artery clamping. I wouldn't do selective artery, I wouldn't do off clamp. This is a completely endophytic tumor. And in fact, this patient had more than one renal artery. I show this as an example because Sam Bayani has really a beautiful video that he shows that I've seen him show multiple times, where he made the mistake of, on a right-sided tumor, he made the mistake of looking at the renal arteries that were coming off of the aorta, uh, I'm sorry, that were, he was looking at it on the right side of the cava rather than looking at it where it was coming off the aorta. And he made a mistake and he didn't clamp, he missed an artery basically and the kidney was bleeding like crazy. He's got a nice video of it. So I, I show this to you to give you the idea that when you're looking at your CT scan, you wanna look at the aorta and how many arteries are coming off the aorta. And then you wanna see if it's branching on the right side of the cava. Because for example, you may see only one artery coming off the aorta, but then by the time you're on the right side of the cava, it's now branched into three. So you go and start your dissection on the right side of the cavity, you find an artery, say, okay, there's the artery, there's only one. Oh, but no, that's one of three branches now. So you may have missed a branch. And again, Sam has a beautiful video of this that, that shows this concept. In this case, I knew the patient had more than one renal artery. It's a right-sided tumor. And because, as you can see here, it's a completely endophytic mid-pole tumor. This is a tough tumor to deal with. So I want to shut down this kidney completely. I don't want this kidney bleeding when I'm cutting into this, or I can get lost and cut into the tumor. So in this case, I actually went intraortocaval, and I actually went to the aorta directly in the intraortocaval cable space, and I found those two renal arteries that I was looking for. This is something that you can do robotically that I think you could never do open that you can actually get to the intraortocaval side of the, um, to, to the left side of the cava basically and get to the aorta. And I found those two arteries, but then it actually turned out there was a third one that I didn't see on the CT. So I actually ended up clamping three. You see the two vessel loops and then there's actually a third renal artery above that one I just clamped that's coming off of the aorta. So this guy had three arteries coming off aorta. Each one of these was branching multiple times. If I had clamped on the right side of the cava, I'd have to clamp like six or eight things. So in this case, sometimes if you look at your CT ahead of time, you see multiple arteries, you want to shut down the kidney, then you can go in the intraoral cable space and clamp it before it's branched. I mentioned the concept of early unclamping. Um, and please, uh, once the live case is ready, just cut me off. We can continue this later. Uh, the concept of early unclamping, anybody here does early unclamping on their partials? A couple people. Anybody here has heard of it but doesn't do it? Okay, a few people. Anybody's never heard of it? All right, everybody's heard of it, good. So the concept here is very simple, obviously. The idea is that rather than clamping the artery and then doing the entire renorophy and unclamping, you just do the deep stitches, come off clamp. 
Now, some people think that the main advantage to this is to shorten your ischemia time, and it does that, but that's not the main advantage, honestly. The main advantage, honestly, is that before you have brought the capsule over to close the defect, you come off clamp and you look for bleeders. Because the worst thing in the world that can happen to you is that you do your renorphy, you complete the entire renorphy, and you've closed up the defect, you take the clamp off, and now there's an arterial spurter coming from inside. Well, what are you going to do? Now you got to start taking stitches out. It's a disaster. So rather than doing that, you just take the clamp off before you do those capsular stitches, and then you can go and put figure of eights or however you want to handle any bleeders. The other benefit, too, is that now there's no time limit anymore. So you do the deep stitches, you come off clamp, and now you got plenty of time. You want to go back and reinforce the collecting system with eight more stitches? No problem. you got plenty of time. So there's no rush now. You can go back and reinforce the collecting system. You can do whatever additional stitching you want to do without any time limit. The downside is that once in a while, yes, you're going to have a little bit of arterial bleeding there. Uh, and again, it's, it's never enough that you're going to have to worry about reclamping. Uh, this is just an example uh, video clip of, of a little spurter that, um, you know, once in a while you'll come across. So here we un early unclamped and you see that I missed this artery in my, in my uh, runner. But it's not a big deal. It's, it's, it's never enough bleeding that you really have to be nervous. Uh, you just, you know, stitch it and you're, you're good to go. And again, you got plenty of time. And then uh, selective artery clamping, we talked about the benefits of selective artery clamping. Uh, if there's one picture that you remember from my talk today, it's this one. So this is the one to put on Twitter for those of you who are social media experts. So I make this graphic here uh, to show you green, good, yellow, caution, red, no way, Jose. This is when to consider doing selective artery clamping. So the green one is like the perfect case for selective artery clamping. Why? Because it's very polar, it's relatively small, it's relatively exophytic. You can see that that upper pole segmental artery is leading right to that tumor. This would be the one to really start with, to really get your experience going with selective artery clamping. You might even do this one electively, meaning patient has two normal kidneys, normal renal function. You could easily clamp the main renal artery, you'd be fine. But you say to yourself, you know what, I got to learn how to do this. I'm going to do it on that green one. Perfect. The yellow one is where you want to be cautious. Why? Because the more mid-pole you get and the more lateral on the kidney, the more overlapping arterial inflow you have to that portion of the kidney. So it's not going to be one segmental artery that feeds that kidney. You're probably going to have a watershed area on some surface of that tumor. So you may end up having to clamp more than one segmental renal artery. Or you, if you only clamp one, you're going to have arterial bleeding on some surface of the tumor. Just be prepared for it. And then the red one is no way, Jose. Don't do segmental artery clamping on the red one. Why? Because it's a big tumor, it's a deep tumor, uh, it's going to have multiple overlapping segmental arteries feeding it, and if you're doing like a lower pole hemianephrectomy, for example, then obviously you're coming through the posterior third of the kidney, and that's being fed by the posterior segmental artery. So you're going to end up having to clamp probably a lower pole segmental artery, the posterior segmental artery, maybe even another mid-pole segmental artery. Uh, so in that case, just clamp the main renal artery. So the red one, don't think that you're going to be able to just clamp one selective artery and, and have a dry field. It's not going to happen. This is the poster child for selective artery clamping. So this is a patient that I did a few years ago. She had two tumors on the same kidney. As you can see, one tumor was anterior, one tumor was posterior. But look at her arterial inflow. It's beautiful. She's got a segmental artery going right to the base of the anterior tumor, and then the posterior segmental artery is going right to the posterior. So in this case, if I had clamp the main renal artery, cut out the anterior tumor, stitch it together, flip the kidney over, cut out the tumor, stitch it up. If I did all of that on one clamp time of the main renal artery, that'd be a pretty long clamp time. But here, fortunately, we just clamped the anterior segmental artery, did that one, unclamped. Flip the kidney over, clamp the posterior segmental artery, do that one, unclamp. So the majority of the kidney was being fed the whole time, and then we just had regional ischemia for these two tumors. And the reason that she needed this is because her GFR going in was 29. So again, one main renal artery clamp, two tumors on both sides of the kidney, she would have gotten into trouble post-op. But fortunately, you can see here these nutcracker tumors, this is what she ended up with after the surgery, and her creatinine settled out at 2.84 by three months, so she did great. And then for the purpose of time, I'm going to skip this as just a video example of selective artery clamping. If we have time, maybe we'll come back to it. And then this is the idea of using the Firefly for perfusion. Again, I'm going to skip that for the purpose of time because I'm sure the live case is going to be ready to go shortly. So again, this is um, just reviewing the concept of more to less with clamping.
lots of options. And then Renora fee, this is just my way. These are my suggestions. Again, I'm gonna go kind of fast, but we can come back to this. One suggestion that I would give you is when you cut your tumor out, don't use tons of cautery. I see some people, like even like experts on doing live cases, and they just take the cautery scissor and they just go crazy and the whole thing is like a charred mess. I recommend against that. And the reason why is for two reasons. Number one is because you're not gonna be able to see if you get too close to the tumor or into the tumor, because it's all char. So you're not gonna be able to assess your margin. Number two, if you get into the collecting system, you're not gonna be able to see it because it's all charred up. Uh, and also, you know, you don't want burnt collecting system trying to heal together because what's it gonna do is gonna fall apart and you're gonna get a urine leak. So when you cut your tumor out, that's the first part of making your renorphy easy. When you cut the tumor out, cut it just cold, cold scissor. I will bipolar arteries if I see them, but I won't use any monopolar cautery. And then um, I'm gonna show you kind of the way that I do a renorphy, but that doesn't matter, it's not important. Because if you ask 10 robotic surgeons how they do a renorphy, you'll get 11 answers for how to do it. There's so many different ways of doing it. It doesn't matter, I just wanna show you the concepts that you need to be aware of. That's more important, and then do it the way you want. So the first thing that I'll mention is that you have to understand the intrarenal anatomy, vascular anatomy of the kidney. So this is your netter picture from medical school, uh, which you probably haven't looked at in a long time. And basically, if you look at the periphery of the kidney, kind of the edge meat of the kidney, the parenchyma on the edge, you just have these little arcuate arteries. These are not the things that are gonna get you in trouble post-op. So I see some early surgeons, residence fellows, when they go and do the Renora feed, they're concentrating a lot on trying to sew way out to the edge of the parenchyma, and then it just tears out. It doesn't even hold. You don't have to do that. Those little tiny vessels out there are not gonna be a problem. What you really need to worry about are these interlobar arteries that are coming up parallel to the collecting system. This is very important parallel to the collecting system, and you'll see them most prominently at the edge of the sinus fat and the parenchyma. So when you're cutting a deep tumor, again, this is one of the things that makes people nervous. I've had surgeons who come and visit me and they say, you know, I won't do any tumors, I won't do any partials if they're down to the sinus fat. And I, well, why not? Well, because they're afraid of collecting system, they're afraid of these big arteries. You don't have to be. So if your tumor is down to the sinus, you should be looking for collecting system and you should be looking for these interlobar arteries that are coming up parallel to the collecting system and they're gonna be at the edge of the fat and the parenchyma. So if you know where they live, then you know what you need to sew when you're done. So where do you need to concentrate your sutures? You need to concentrate them where these blue arrowheads are, right at the edge of the sinus and the parenchyma, that's where these major arteries live. You should be looking for them. And again, I'll even bipolar them if I see them. So if I have this tumor preoperatively, I'm looking at this tumor and I'm already planning in my head my renorophy before I even cut the tumor out. I'm looking at my CT, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, okay, the green area, I don't really care about. I don't need to sew that. I really need to concentrate my sutures where the red arrows are, where the sinus fat meets the edge of parenchyma, and of course the yellow arrows, the collecting system, I've gotta close that. So again, the concept is the more important thing. So how do I do it? This is, again, my personal preference, but I don't care as long as you get the job done. The idea, again, is that you gotta concentrate your sutures on the edge of that sinus fat and the parenchyma. So my routine is to use overlapping VLOC sutures. So I'll run one VLOC suture along the right side of the defect. So you can see I'm trying to get that edge of parenchyma and sinus fat. I'm trying to get collecting system, major vessels in the middle. And then I'll do a second runner VLOC that overlaps in the middle, but covers that left side of the defect, uh, so that when I'm done, the picture looks like this uh, over here, again, overlapping in the middle. So the blue arrows is the right stitch. You see the, the, um, the uh, lapper tie on the outside of the capsule. I ran the right side of the defect, came out over here, and then the yellow arrows is the second suture. They overlap in the middle. It really pulls the defect together, makes it smaller for the next layer, uh, but the idea is that you've got two layers in the middle where there's collecting system major vessels, but again, we're really concentrating, focusing on that edge of the sinus fat and the parenchyma. You can see the edge way out there doesn't really have any sutures in it at all. So this is a video version of that that I'm gonna skip. And then the last thing I'm gonna tell you is the most controversial. It's what Jim gives me a hard time. He, he teases me and calls it the giant needle club, uh, the GNC. But I welcome you all to join the GNC if you're interested. Usually when I present this at various meetings, I like to take a poll of who 
likes it and is intrigued and says to themselves, maybe, maybe I'll give this a try. And then who thinks it's absolutely crazy and they would never do it in a million years. And it's usually about 50-50. Uh, but I was just at a meeting yesterday, the Kaiser Robotic meeting, and I presented this. And for the first time ever, only one person in the audience said it's absolutely crazy. I would never do it. And other people said, yeah, we would try this. So I'm going to share it with you. You can like it, don't like it. Again, this is just my way. This is the traditional method for the capsular stitch for that second layer, the outer layer of your Renorophy. This is the way that 99.99 percent of surgeons do it. They go through the capsule, across the defect to the other side, come out, sliding clip. You can do this as a runner, you can do this interrupted, all different types of sutures you can use. You can use a V-lock, you can use a Vicryl, monocryl, whatever you want. But this is the traditional way of doing it. The problem with this and the reason I don't like it and the reason why I don't, I don't do it is because it doesn't do anything to address the middle part. And that's where the business is. That's where the arteries are. That's where the collecting system is. So really all this does is it pulls the capsule together over the defect, makes the kidney look more normal, and then you feel really good about it. But it didn't actually help you prevent urine leaks or bleeding. If anything, it left a dead space in there. And that dead space is why you get AV fistulas and pseudoaneurysms. Because if a little artery is pumping in there and you've closed the capsule over it, that is a pseudoaneurysm. It's a contained arterial bleed, pseudoaneurysm. If there's a venous sinus somewhere nearby where that pseudoaneurysm can then feed into, that's an AV fistula. So you've basically just contained the bleeder rather than eliminated the bleeder. So that's why I don't do it this way. The way that I do it eliminates that possibility, eliminates pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, and I've done about 500 robotic partial nephrectomies. I've never had a pseudoaneurysm, never had an AV fistula, never had a patient go to interventional radiology. I don't know anyone else who's done more than 100 or 200 of these and hasn't had that happen. And this is why I think it's the case, is because I do this. I go deep to the entire defect. I take a larger needle and I go deep to the entire defect. I come out the other side and then I do the sliding clip and then it squeezes the entire thing, including the middle, where the vessels and the collecting system is. And then you just line them up and now you've shut down that entire area. It doesn't bring the capsule together on the top, so it doesn't look as pretty, but it doesn't matter. Again, after hundreds of cases, I've never had a patient go to IR. To do this, you need some big needles. So when I have visiting surgeons come out to our hospital, uh, which you're all welcome to do if anybody's interested, we do it once a month, no more than three surgeons, so there's a lot of interaction. We do three cases in one day, prostate, partial, wild card case, lecture the night before. It's always on a Monday, so you only miss one day of work. Uh, so you're welcome to come. But they always take a picture of my suture box. This is my partial nephrectomy suture box. The nurses get it out when I'm doing a partial, and they put it right next to the console. And they always come and they take a picture of this to see what the needles are that I use. The CT1 needles, you can see there, they measure it on the, they write it on the box. It's two and a half centimeters wide by one centimeter deep. That's only going to help you do like a two centimeter tumor. So if it's anything more than a two centimeter tumor, you got to go up to the CTX, which is three and a half by one and a half, or the XLH which is the largest needle, it's four and a half centimeters wide, two and a half centimeters deep. The XLH needle will do any size tumor, even a hemi-nephrectomy, you can get across that defect with the XLH needle. But the XLH needle will not fit through a port, even a 15. The CTX needle is the largest needle that you will fit through a port, and it just barely makes it through a 12. In fact, you have to straighten it to get it out. The XLH we put in percutaneously. So my assistant puts it through the skin, I grab it, pull it into the body, I use it, I send it back out when I'm done. So this is what it looks like. And again, half of the people look at this and they're horrified by it. Half of the people love it and say, oh my God, I gotta try this. The idea again is that you're going deep to the entire defect coming out the other side. The depth should be the same depth as the initial running suture you made. You don't wanna take a huge piece of kidney and kill it. You wanna go at the same level so you're not killing a lot of kidney and then come out the other side. So this is the XLH, the large needle. So you can see here, I'm through the capsule, I go deep to the other side, you can kind of see the kidney deflecting underneath, so you can kind of see the depth of your needle, and then you come out the other side, make sure you have enough capsule so that you can sque squeeze the hell out of it when you put that hemolock on there. And then obviously we've just lined them up, and then here's the hemolock, squeeze the heck out of it, and now there's no way that thing's gonna bleed, there's no way you're gonna leak urine, even if you missed something in there. So that's the final product. Again, the capsule's not closed over this, it doesn't matter. You don't need the capsule to be closed. That thing is basically, that entire defect is now being squeezed with super physiologic amount of pressure. It's not gonna bleed, it's not gonna leak urine. I let these patients go home the next day, even many of them the same day. So Giant Needle Club, welcome, you're, you're welcome to join. 
So a reminder about Neris again, I'll stop there. Uh, again, if we have time, if the live case goes shorter, we can come back, maybe I'll show a couple videos of the clamping stuff. But um, again, we'll take plenty of questions during the live case.